I've heard the story of the rich young ruler from childhood, read it dozens of times, preached sermons on it quite a few times, but I've never thought to ask one simple curiosity-based question. How did the rich young ruler come to be rich? One answer is that, of course, we cannot finally know, and another is that it may not be important to the text, but this week I can't stop wondering about it. You see, I've been skimming a book called Jesus and the Peasants by Douglas Oakman, and it just wasn't easy to get rich in first century Galilee or Judea. There was no stock market to invest in, no burgeoning tech industry to get in on the ground floor of, not even a scratch-off Mega Millions lottery. There wasn't a thriving merchant trade, certainly not in the bucolic backcountry of Galilee. It was, for the most part, an agrarian subsistence-based economy. Dirt farming, shepherding, fishing. Think of the imagery from Jesus' parables. Simple shepherds and sowers of seed and vine dressers. The most common source of wealth would have been good land. And the acquisition of land? Well, here's how you got land. Number one, you inherited it. Through a system of patrimony, land passed from a father to the oldest son, generation to generation to generation. It wasn't generally split up because if a father divided the land among three sons who further divided it among their sons, in a generation or two you'd have parcels the size of postage stamps. So land passed from the father to the oldest son who became the caretaker of the entire next generation, which is why the system was so very hard on childless women, widows, orphans, and aliens. They weren't participants in the system. They couldn't readily acquire land for food, much less for wealth. They had to beg or glean leftovers from the fields of others. The system was totally stacked against them. Another way to acquire land was to receive it through the system of fealty. Through loyalty or service to the emperor or his underlings, one might be awarded a tract of land, which of course had been taken from someone else. And a third way to acquire land was through the debt system. A subsistence farmer would use his land as collateral for a loan to purchase seed, for example, in order to try to grow more crops and eke out a little bit more of a living. But if the year were a dry one, the harvest poor, and the crop insufficient to pay off the debt, the land might be taken away by the wealthy maker of the loan as payment for the debt. The land would then be rented back to the previous owner, now as a tenant farmer. Or a tax collector would gobble up land from destitute farmers in default. And default was all too common because the combination of temple tithes and taxes to the empire was daunting, and one year of drought could put a subsistence farmer under. In short, the ancient Near East was no place of bootstrap success stories like a farmer worked his small plot of land, tended it wisely, acquired a little more, expanded his holdings, and built himself a tidy nest egg through earnest work and wise land management. It was more often a story of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So how did the rich young ruler come to be rich, especially given that he is young? And again, we cannot answer because we've no specific information to go on, but it is a curiosity. Now we have no reason to question the basic morality or the general decency of the rich young ruler, by the way. He isn't depicted as a villain or as a thief. But the system has worked for him 
at least as much as he has worked for himself. He does seek Jesus out, genuinely interested in his teaching, and he asks, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And while his question does display a certain wealthy person's worldview, how much does it cost, I'll buy it, as if eternal life is a commodity to be acquired, we have no reason to think that the man's question is insincere. Now a brief word here. I've shared before that eternal life, as taught in much of the New Testament, is not just an everlasting reward for good behavior in this life. It refers instead to participation in the final establishment of God's empire or God's kingdom or God's righteous rule, which will at last surpass all earthly rulers and all earthly kingdoms. Eternal life begins now and extends eternally. This is why Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come near, or the kingdom of heaven is within you or among you. And it is why Jesus prays, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the rich young ruler is asking Jesus, how do I become a participant now in the righteous rule of God? What must I do? And Jesus responds, if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses tells the children of Israel, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live. Jesus, at this point, is essentially reiterating the standard boilerplate mosaic teaching. But the rich young man presses his line of questioning. Which commandments, which acts of devotion are most important to display my faithfulness and my righteousness? And Jesus responds with all of the relational commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And then he summarizes, love your neighbor as yourself. The young man is quick to respond, I've kept all of these, what do I still lack? Now here's the point that I think gets to the heart of this passage because the next words out of Jesus' mouth are not one more thing that the man must do. Rather, I believe, they serve the purpose of revealing that the man has not done all of these other things as well or as thoroughly as he imagines that he has. He has treated the commandments, these relational commandments, as boxes to be checked more than as a way of life to be entered into. I'll tell a brief personal story to illustrate what I think is happening in this interaction between Jesus and the rich young ruler. The first thing that you must know is that I am prone in times of stress or anxiety to sit up in bed in the middle of the night and start talking in my sleep utterly convinced that I am awake and it becomes Amy's job to gently talk me back into reality though sometimes she makes a bit of a sport of it. One such occurrence was years ago when I was a naval officer and at some point in the middle of the night I sat bolt upright in bed and began to fumble with the covers. What are you doing? asked my beautiful wife. I have to leave early for work, I replied. There's a big hole in the outbound lane at the naval base, and I have to jump it in order to get to work. The first indication that I was not fully awake. And Amy persisted, that doesn't make sense, dear. Why would there be a hole, and how would you jump over it? 
and I grew frustrated at just how dense she could be. There is a hole in the outbound lane, I emphatically insisted. And this is how brilliant my wife is. She calmly replied, Dear, if the hole is in the outbound lane, then why do you have to jump it on the way in to work? And at that point, my sleep-addled mind just locked up. Her words revealed that what I was insisting, what I was believing to the core of my being, was not really true and couldn't be true. I realized that I had been asleep, and Amy awakened me to reality. Now, I think Jesus' response to the rich young man functions similarly as a wake-up call. The young man says, I have kept all of the commandments and loved my neighbor as myself. What more must I do? And Jesus says, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And I don't think that means you're doing quite excellent, really, but if you wish to be perfect, if you want to get an A plus and not just an A, if you want the gold star, if you want to put the cherry on top of the sundae, if you want to finish the job, then sell what you own and give it to the poor. That will be next level discipleship. I don't think it means that at all. One step from perfection is imperfection. I think Jesus is saying you cannot enter into God's perfect rule if you're invested in a system that disregards the poor. You can't love your neighbor as yourself if you consider your wealth or your privilege as being independent of your neighbor's need. Wake up. Sporadic acts of charity don't bring justice or righteousness. Throwing breadcrumbs over the walls of your gated community doesn't amount to neighbor love. You are a participant in a system that makes the poor poor and keeps the poor poor. If you wish to really live, if you wish to be perfect, then really love your neighbor. And Jesus isn't saying that harshly or judgmentally, not at all. But he's saying, this isn't the cherry on the Sunday. This is the Sunday. This is the kingdom. The needs of all are to be considered. And if the needs of any are disregarded, then the whole cannot be whole and the kingdom cannot come. It's quite an awakening. And having received his wake-up call, the man goes away sad because he's much farther from the kingdom than he had imagined. It's going to be hard, Jesus says, for a rich person to enter the kingdom, to enter God's righteous reign here on earth, because the road to the kingdom isn't paved with good intentions or with intermittent acts of kindness, but with righteous relations and true solidarity. It will require devaluing the very things that make you successful, important, comfortable, admirable by the world's standards. And instead of depending on those things, depending upon God. It will require meeting your neighbor's needs as righteous work. Because you cannot enter a kingdom that values everyone equally when your very values keep your neighbor on a fragile footing. It's a high, high demand that astonishes even Jesus' disciples. Then who can be saved, they ask. And Jesus responds, With God, with God all things are possible. Now, if my reading is correct, 
And we have a lot of work to do. And much of that work is related to unequal systems of advantage. It is a fiction that anyone in this country can grow up to be president. Or that simple hard work is sufficient to rise from rags to riches. Some select few may do that, but they're the exception, not the rule, and they certainly don't do it without help. The deck is stacked against some today as it was against widows and orphans and aliens in Jesus' day. In a horse race, you handicap the fastest horse. In golf, the handicap is given to the stronger golfer. Our economy handicaps those who are already a step or a lap behind. And much of the disadvantage in our society is related to race. Simply to have darker skin is to have to work five times harder even to live. Systemic actions across generations of our nation, voter disenfranchisement, redlining, withholding of loans or the extension of loans at extortionate rates, false imprisonment, unequal justice, and cash bail has led to a large sector of our society living daily with a knee on their neck, unable to breathe freely. Unequal access, unequal opportunity, unequal participation in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the question for any of us who do not live that daily reality is, what more must we do to enter God's righteous reign? And Jesus' answer, as it ever was, is, you must let go of your advantage in service of your neighbor's disadvantage. Until you do this, the kingdom will remain distant. The kingdom won't come without justice, and justice won't come without fundamental change that is far, far, far larger than charity. Justice won't come from our saying everyone is equal when everyone's access to, opportun access to opportunity is not. As for those in the present age who are rich, which means simply having more than enough, owning a home, owning a car, having health insurance, access to higher education, never being hungry. Holy cow! I'm the rich young ruler. How did I get to be that? As to those in the present age who are rich, command them not to be haughty, or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, be rich in good works, generous and ready to share. And giving a crumb from my loaf is not sharing. Ready to share their power, ready to share their advantage, ready to share their access, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, that they may take hold of the life that is really life. Because it isn't really life. It can never be really life if some have no seat at the table. There's just one more thing we must do. Amen.